You hear the word revolution thrown around a lot these days. And when people use that word revolution, they usually mean something that brings a great change or something new, like the Industrial Revolution. Or they may simply be referring to a revolt or the overthrow of a government, as in the French Revolution or the Bolshevik Revolution. But that's not always what the word meant. Prior to the Enlightenment, political revolution sometimes referred not to a new government, but rather referred to bringing things back to the way they once were. To revolve like a planet or a turning door or a vinyl record, back to the position things once were in. A word which now seems synonymous with progress actually kind of meant the opposite. Originally, such revolutions were relatively minor restorations, as when the French king Henry IV converted to Catholicism in 1593, or when power was transferred between various factions during the pro- and anti-Medician revolts. But it was during the English Civil War that the English poet and statesman John Milton put the concept of revolution on a cosmic level. For Milton, as mankind moves forward, we should also spin backward, as it were, like a planet in orbit. And not just a little bit, but all the way back to the beginning, to the Garden of Eden, bringing the garden forward into the present as the wheel of time spins. And for Milton, this meant one thing politically, liberty. People should be free, tyrants should be overthrown, and human rights should be held sacred. During the English Civil War, of course, the Parliament of England rebelled against the King of England, Charles I, ultimately executing him for treason, proclaiming him a tyrant, traitor, murderer, and public enemy. The monarchy was subsequently abolished, and in its place was instituted the brief Commonwealth of England. As you might expect, not everyone wanted this new republic. In fact, many thought that it was not only wrong to execute Charles, but to abolish the monarchy, and many consequently were clamoring for the monarchy to be restored. And the task fell to John Milton to defend the new republic against those who wanted to reinstate the monarchy and to convince the English people that a liberal republican government was the best, and perhaps most importantly, the most natural form of government, in that it most aligned with human nature. Milton set out to convince England that the people are, under God, the original of all just power, that the commons of England in parliament assembled have the supreme power in this nation. Now, while Milton never used the word revolution, in fact, it wouldn't be until the 20th century that some historians would call the English Civil War a revolution, Milton nevertheless argued that the Commonwealth was in some sense a return to how things were meant to be, back when man was first created. He wrote that no man who knows aught can be so stupid to deny that all men naturally were born free, being the image and resemblance of God himself, and were, by privilege, above all the creatures, born to command and not to obey, and that they originally lived so. A free republican society was legitimate because it was a turning back, if ever so little, to the way things were meant to be. Humans were meant to be free, and they were not meant to obey any other human. And while Milton wrote many propagandistic defenses of the republican government, his meta-narratival perspective of liberty is nowhere more clear and powerful and nowhere more authentic and convictional than in his poem Paradise Lost, which was written not to defend the English Commonwealth, but to tell the story of the world in microcosm. In Paradise Lost, Milton writes that God created human beings in the Garden of Eden free and with fair equality. But when Adam and Eve sinned against God, not only were they thrown out of the garden, but they underwent a fundamental psychological change in which their first instinct was to try and control each other. 
Outside the garden, things only got worse as time went on. Their descendants threw away peace, liberty, and equality, and turned to war, conquest, and slavery. Milton recounts the Genesis stories, telling us that mankind became so wicked that God wiped them out with a global flood. After which, in Milton's vision, human beings return briefly again to private agriculture. This second source of men, writes Milton, with some regard to what is just and right, shall lead their lives and multiply apace, laboring the soil and reaping plenteous crop, corn, wine, and oil, and from the herd or flock oft sacrificing bullock, lamb, or kid, with large wine offerings, poured and sacred feast, shall spend their days in joy unblamed, and dwell long time in peace by families and tribes under paternal rule, till one shall rise of proud ambitious heart, who, not content with fair equality, fraternal state, will arrogate dominion undeserved over his brethren, and quite dispossess concord and law of nature from the earth. Hunting and men, not beasts, shall be his game, with war and hostile snare, such as refused subjection to his empire tyrannous. Here Milton is sketching the biblical figure of Nimrod, portraying him as a tyrant, imposing his will on other men, in opposition to God's created design. Adam, in response to this vision of future events, recoils with disgust, saying, O execrable son, so to aspire above his brethren, to himself assuming authority usurped, from God not given. He gave us only over beast, fish, fowl, dominion absolute. That right we hold by his donation, but man over men he made not lord. Such title to himself reserving, human left from human free. The angel Michael, who has been showing Adam this vision, responds that Adam is right to abhor tyrants who seek to subdue what he calls rational liberty. However, Michael goes on to explain that since man disobeyed God and was cast out of the garden, it is impossible for humans to be truly free again. Justly thou abhorst that son who on the quiet state of men such trouble brought, affecting to subdue rational liberty. Yet know withal, since thy original lapse, true liberty is lost, which always with right reason dwells twinned, and from her hath no individual being. Reason in man obscured or not obeyed, immediately inordinate desires and upstart passions catch the government from reason, and to servitude reduce man till then free. Pause a moment to notice the difference between individual ethical liberty and civil liberty. The loss of personal liberty and the inability to govern oneself is intertwined with the loss of civil liberty. When people are enslaved to their passions, the result is statist tyranny. They are controlled by others and they in turn will seek to control others. Milton continues, therefore since man permits within himself unworthy powers to reign over free reason, God in judgment just subjects him from without to violent lords, who oft as undeservedly enthrall his outward freedom. Tyranny must be, though to the tyrant thereby no excuse. Yet sometimes nations will decline so low from virtue which is reason, that no wrong but justice and some fatal curse annexed deprives them of their outward liberty, their inward lost. While there is so much that we could say about this pregnant passage, and which I do plan to say in future videos, for the purposes of this essay, what Milton is saying 
is that when the Garden of Paradise was lost, the original liberty of man was lost with it. For Milton, the Garden is the matrix of liberty. The Garden is both symbolic of a free and independent psyche, and it also constitutes the practical conditions on which liberty can exist. The loss of the original Garden means a loss of original liberty. But of course, even in Paradise Lost, there is a hint of regaining and recreating the garden for which humans are meant. Themes I've touched on previously, and I will link those videos in the description. This new paradise, which Milton hints at, is to be primarily an internal paradise, an individual Garden of Eden in your heart and mind. But not merely so. Indeed, we see in Milton's political life someone who was constantly fighting for what he considered greater and greater civil liberty. In a pamphlet written to encourage the formation of a free commonwealth, Milton proclaimed that they who seek nothing but their own just liberty have always right to win it and keep it whenever they have power. Be the voices never so numerous that oppose it. While I've not yet found an explicit call to recreate the liberal paradise of Eden in Milton's polemical writings, many of which were written prior to Paradise Lost, his agrarian symbolism is nevertheless front and center. In his second defense of the English people, he hoped that Britain would be celebrated for endless ages as a soil most genial to the growth of liberty. He saw himself and England on a world stage, surrounded by congregated multitudes. I now imagine that from the columns of Hercules to the Indian Ocean, I behold the nations of the earth recovering that liberty which they so long had lost, and that the people of this island are transporting to other countries a plant of more beneficial qualities and more noble growth than that which Triptolemus is reported to have carried from region to region, that they are disseminating the blessings of civilization and freedom among cities, kingdoms, and nations. Milton's vision of liberty was global, and his plant of liberty would indeed be transplanted to other shores, taking root particularly in American soil. The Oxford Handbook of Milton says that Milton became part of New England literature. He was the most widely read author in 18th century America. If a home in the American colonies possessed any books besides the Bible, they were likely to be The Pilgrim's Progress and Paradise Lost. During the fight for independence, Milton's epic was adapted, for instance, by Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson to support the cause of the revolutionaries. The colonial Americans, still swelling from the storm surge of the First Great Awakening, read Milton's extra-biblical poem as both the great English-language epic of man's fall and later as a Republican political tract. Its powerful political influence lies in the fact that it tells the story of the world in microcosm. Colonial cries for liberty were therefore not merely the pangs of discontents, but the outworking of the grand cosmic story. And Paradise Lost sets the agenda of liberty not just in an adolescent desire to do whatever one wants, but it sets liberty firmly within the framework of the grand Meta narrative of mankind. Thomas Paine, one of the men most responsible for encouraging the colonial public to break with England, was, despite being profoundly non religious, yet profoundly influenced by Milton, to say nothing of the ancient classics. And he sketched an equally cosmic view of liberty when he wrote this poetic vision In a chariot of light, from the regions of the day, the goddess of liberty came. Ten thousand celestials directed her way, and hither conducted the dame. 
a fair budding branch from the gardens above, where millions with millions agree, she brought in her hand as a pledge of her love, and the plant she named Liberty Tree. And she planted it in, of all places, Boston, Massachusetts. The point is that whether we view it in biblical terms or in terms of classical Greco-Roman myth, to be free is to recapture, recultivate the original paradisal garden. To be free is to exist as humans are meant to exist. For the revolutionaries, the soil of the world may have grown fallow in its cursed state, and while it ever tended toward choking out the fruits of man so that what fruit of liberty there was only grew sporadically here and there, the soil of the world nevertheless had to be tilled up to freedom for a bounty of liberty. When the American colonies finally did declare their independence from Great Britain on July 4th, 1776, they did so with words of equality, natural rights, and conditional agreements very likely inspired by Milton's treatise on the tenure of kings and magistrates. The man who wrote the words of the Declaration of Independence itself, and who would become the third president of the United States, was Thomas Jefferson. And he, too, was an avid student of John Milton's poetry and prose. In Jefferson's library at his home in Monticello, we would have found, alongside the death mask of Oliver Cromwell, a copy of Paradise Lost, of which Jefferson was known to have owned at least three copies in his life, one of which is the only book in existence that is known to contain the signatures of two American founders, Jefferson himself and his friend James Madison, the father of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and the fourth president of the United States. Which means that Paradise Lost was just one of the hundreds of books these two men exchanged over the 50 years of their intellectual friendship and political collaboration. And they were by no means alone in their love for Milton. John Adams, the second president of the United States, was also a fervent devotee of Milton. He names Milton alongside the likes of John Locke as a man who will convince any candid mind that there is no good government but what is Republican. The only valuable part of the British Constitution is so, because the very definition of a republic is an empire of laws and not of men. According to John S. Tanner and Justin Collings, both John Adams and Thomas Jefferson read Milton throughout their lives, but they read him very differently. As young men, each responded enthusiastically to Paradise Lost. Both men looked to Milton's prose as a source for their own Republican writings. Both Jefferson and Adams self-consciously embraced the libertarian legacy of Milton and his fellow 17th century English Commonwealthmen. As 18th century Republicans, however, Jefferson was drawn to the radical, secular dimensions of Milton and his contemporary revolutionaries, whereas Adams was drawn to the rational, pious elements of the Puritan Revolution, revealing anti-Jacobin sentiments of an arch-federalist. Whatever their differences, I can't help but wonder when the last time was that any American president read, recommended, and jotted down notes from a masterpiece like Paradise Lost as Adams, Jefferson, and Madison did to say nothing of the American public at large, as was mentioned previously. When was the last time the American public as a whole had Paradise Lost on their shelves? It seems that a free people are a well-read people, a people of epic poetry. I knew from reading Jefferson that gardening was the passion of his. As one scholar puts it, it was the most absorbing of all the interests of one who was the foremost philosopher of his time, governor of Virginia, secretary of state in President Washington's cabinet, vice president, and president of the United States, president of the American Philosophical Society for 18 years, and founder of the University of Virginia. Jefferson himself wrote that, 
I have often thought that if heaven had given me choice of my position and calling, it should have been on a rich spot of earth, well watered and near a good market for the productions of the garden. No occupation is so delightful to me as the culture of the earth, and no culture comparable to that of the garden. Such a variety of subjects, someone always coming to perfection. The failure of one thing repaired by the success of another. And instead of one harvest, a continued one through the year, under a total want of demand except for our family table, I am still devoted to the garden. But though an old man, I am but a young gardener. And when I learned that Jefferson was also a student of Milton, I wondered if there wasn't a deeper connection between this man's philosophy, his love of nature and gardening, and his politics. I was determined to go to Monticello to see his land and gardens for myself. Perhaps I could glean something from the place that I could not from the books. And since it was so close, I decided also to go to Madison's Montpelier as well. But when I stepped off the back porch of Madison's mansion and saw nestled in the trees a hundred yards or so away something I didn't expect, the wall of a garden, and because I knew that George Washington, the first president of the United States, also kept an elaborate garden at his home, I sensed that I was onto something deeper and that for the American revolutionaries, there was a profound connection between the garden and liberty. And this suspicion was confirmed for me a couple days later, when I set foot on Washington's Mount Vernon and found in the gift shop, as if fallen from heaven, a book called Founding Gardeners by historian Andrea Wolfe. In it, she discusses the importance of nature and gardens for these men, as hobbies, as symbols, and as practical necessities. Golden cornfields and endless rows of cotton plants became symbols for America's economic independence from Britain. Towering trees became a reflection of a strong and vigorous nation. Native species were imbued with patriotism and proudly planted in gardens, while metaphors drawn from the natural world brought plants and gardening into politics. The Founding Fathers' passion for nature, plants, gardens, and agriculture is woven deeply into the fabric of America and aligned with their political thought, both reflecting and influencing it. In fact, I believe it's impossible to understand the making of America without looking at the Founding Fathers as farmers and gardeners. Plowing, planting, and vegetable gardening were more than profitable and enjoyable occupations. They were political acts, bringing freedom and independence. In America, as in England, the Garden of Liberty leapt off the pages of ancient scripture and modern literature into real life. Gardens were everyday living symbols of transcendent realities. William Howard Adams writes that Milton's poetic vision of nature in the Garden of Eden has long been recognized as one of the seminal modern literary sources of the Romantic School of Landscape Design. Jefferson may have been reading Milton when he was drafting his first plans for the gardens at Monticello. And Kemmer Anderson goes so far as to argue that we can imagine the glimpse of Milton's Eden incarnate at Jefferson's Monticello. But what sets the Americans apart from the English is that for Americans, gardens were far more than symbols. They were a practical necessity. If Milton and the biblical tradition implied that liberty requires a physical environment of cultivated nature, American farmers and philosophers made that explicit. Freedom requires the garden. And take George Washington, for example. While not so much of a literary man, according to Jefferson, Washington only read books on agriculture and English history, Washington nevertheless embraced both the symbolic and the pragmatic aspects of the garden. 
as he spread manure on his fields or planted a tree that he had found in his forest, he gave physical embodiment to his belief that the future of America lay in the fields and forests. The recent experiments in the utilitarian parts of his estate were aimed at improving agriculture, while the plantations of ornamental native species in front of the house carried a symbolic message that this new nation would be independent, self-sufficient, and strong. Both areas, in their way, illustrated Washington's fervent patriotism. And thus, Mount Vernon was his private statement of independence and Republican simplicity, wrought from the soil and trees of his country. So Washington's home was both a practical tool and a living symbol of liberty, a physical embodiment of the philosophy that crowded the pages of writers like Ben Franklin, John Adams, Jefferson, and Madison. Namely, the idea that liberty required a cultivated and respectful relationship with nature. To be free meant recapturing in the physical world the garden. And for those of us who do love liberty and the founding principles of the United States, I think this connection between nature and freedom has too long been ignored or forgotten. American writers, poets, and political thinkers of the past have long identified nature as the nexus of liberty, creating the external environmental conditions as well as the internal personal conditions necessary for political freedom. In an article entitled Nature and Democracy, Morality, Walt Whitman drew this very conclusion. Democracy, most of all, affiliates with the open air, is sunny, hardy, and sane only with nature, just as much as art is. Something is required to temper both, to check them, restrain them from excess, morbidity. I have wanted before departure to bear special testimony to a very old lesson and requisite. American democracy in its myriad personalities, in factories, workshops, stores, offices, through the dense streets and houses of cities, and all their manifold sophisticated life, must either be fibered, vitalized, by regular contact with outdoor light and air and growths, farm scenes, animals, fields, trees, birds, sun warmth, and free skies, or it will certainly dwindle and pale. We cannot have grand races of mechanics, work people, and commonality, the only specific purpose of America, on any less terms. I conceive of no flourishing and heroic elements of democracy in the United States, or of democracy maintaining itself at all, without the nature element forming a main part, to be its health element and beauty element, to really underlie the whole politics, sanity, religion, and art of the new world. Democracy, a word which etymologically means simply rule of the people. It's a word whose usage is varied and has evolved over the centuries to indicate the different forms of rule by the people. And we would do well to note that Whitman did not mean by democracy what people often mean today, which is essentially something like the rule of the majority over the minority. Whitman meant nothing of the sort. In another piece entitled Democracy in the New World, Whitman appeals to one Canon Kingsley for his definition of democracy. The ideal form of human society, Canon Kingsley declares, is democracy. A nation, and were it even possible a whole world, of free men, lifting free foreheads to God and nature, calling no man master, for one is their master, even God, knowing and doing their duties toward the maker of the universe, and therefore to each other, not from fear, nor calculation of profit or loss, but because they have seen the beauty of righteousness and trust and peace, because the law of God is in their hearts. 
Such a nation, such a society, what nobler conception of moral existence can we form? Would not that indeed be the kingdom of God come on earth? It seems to me such a definition of democracy is quite in keeping with either technical anarchism or republicanism, depending on how one weaves one's logical tapestry. And given that Milton himself long pondered writing an epic on King Arthur or King Alfred before ultimately deciding to write on the topic of man's fall, one might well suppose that neither his regicidal writings nor his proto-liberalism completely excluded forms of monarchy. At any rate, my point is that I am certainly not arguing necessarily for or against any specific form of government here, but only for individual liberty and for how liberty can be secured in any varying scale and degree in any form of government or lack thereof. Even the staunchest monarchist, if he is reasonable, will surely recognize that there is a difference between a true king and a tyrant. And when power is vested in one individual, it's the pragmatic and symbolic principles of the garden that hedge and check the good king, ensuring that he remains a king instead of devolving into a tyrant. In democracy, the garden checks the will of the majority and says, thus far shall you go and no farther. In many respects, I am a simple pragmatist and quite content to sow my seeds over every kind of ground and soil, even if it grows poorly here and there or in some places not at all. My hope is that it will grow somewhere, because for me, the need is urgent. We are living in a time when politics is becoming more and more prevalent in everyday life. Things that were not political previously are becoming political, which means that people, the polis, the state, the government, are trying to have more and more say in more and more things. And at the same time, references to liberty and freedom are dwindling in these discussions, whereas references to equality, equity, and justice are skyrocketing. The unspoken implication being that social justice does not involve the personal liberty of the people, and that for many people, whether or not equity and equality involve freedom is beside the point. Whereas I tend to think that justice without liberty is no justice at all. I'm an ordinary man who desires nothing more than just an ordinary chance to live exactly as he likes and do precisely what he wants. Whatever course the world may take, politically or societally, I have every intention of being free and remaining free, living as I please, as best as I am able, and on my own terms, to the greatest degree possible, with malice to none and goodwill to all, infringing no one else's God-given rights and helping as many people as I can to live better lives. That being the case, I've decided to make a series of videos that explore how to be and remain free. And I'll discuss how the garden brings liberty and secures independence, both symbolically as well as practically. This series will hopefully discuss the garden as a symbol and means of self-sufficient independence, self-protection, of peace and tolerance, of moral and technical development, of humility and things deemed weak, subverting worldly strong. We'll be talking about thinkers mentioned in this essay, as well as others like Emerson and Thoreau, and Chinese Taoist philosophers. I understand that not everyone might be interested in this topic, so I probably won't release all of these videos at once, but I'll weave them in between other videos on other topics. Maybe releasing a Garden of Liberty video every other week or maybe once a month, depending on how much you guys are interested in it. Feel free to let me know in the comments. In a sense, this series is individualistic and apolitical, insofar as I am primarily looking to my own affairs. I'm not looking to advance a movement or a political party, nor am I looking to call anyone out. By putting these thoughts on YouTube, I am merely casting my bread upon the waters and hoping that the seeds of my garden may get caught in the wind of a new spirit and spread throughout the world. 
fulfilling Milton's vision. The nature of the garden is to grow, in a controlled fashion, but to grow nonetheless. And besides, I feel that this talent is not mine to bury. If you want to support me, the best thing you can do is like the video, leave a comment, and if you think more people should see it, then be the algorithm you want to see in the world. Share it with anyone you might think is interested. Till next time, see you all in the comments.